The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Wow. Go ahead. Give the Lord a clap offering of praise. Come on. Just stand to your feet. We're going to open in a word of prayer. What a wonderful day to be together and to worship the Lord. Uh, just enjoyed the, I don't know if enjoyed is really the right word, but uh, the message that was delivered in the first service was simply powerful. And I know that uh, God's going to speak to our hearts and lives in this gathering. Amen. Amen. Lord, we just thank you. You are so good to us. God, we need you today. We need your presence. We need your power. We need your wisdom. We need your guidance. Father, we are a people in need of you, so come. Make yourself known in this gathering. May everything that is said and done honor you. Father, I pray that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to us today. Lord, may we have obedient hearts that will walk it out and live our lives consecrated unto you, separated for your good pleasure. God, I pray that you just bless every individual, every family, every couple, everyone under the sound of my voice, Lord, on this campus and those watching online, Father, make yourself known, we ask, in the mighty name of Jesus. Together, everybody said amen. 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 Come on, just shout, Lord, you are good. Here we go. Two, three, four. Lord, you're good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Say it again, say. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. People from every nation. People from every nation and tongue. From generation to generation. We worship you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say, Lord, you 
are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Oh, I just want to praise your holy name. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Oh, forever and ever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy And the Lord is good. And I am so glad that we get to be in the house of the Lord and worship him this morning. Yes. So this morning, I want to welcome you. I am Pastor Amanda. I am the youth pastor here. And I just want to say welcome. We are so glad you're here at Oxford Salute God today this morning. If this is your first time here, we would love for you guys to get to know us a little bit better. We want to get to know you a little bit better. We have a connect card on the back of every seat, and we would love for you to fill that out and either drop it in the offering bag on your way out or come to the north end of the lobby where we have a special gift for you. And we would love to just get to meet you face to face because in all honesty, there's a lot of faces in here. And I have my contacts in, but I can be honest, I still can't see half of y'all. Um, so it is one of those things where we would love to connect. And online, there's a lot of people watching this morning online. Some of them are, are of course, church members that can't be here. We want to just say hi. You know, we got Doris King, we got Miss Elaine, we got Bill and Kathy Hartman, by the way. We would just want to pray for them. Um, but there's also some other people that we don't know. And if it's your first time watching online, and we want to know that we want to get to know you. So connect with us at oag.church slash connect. Also, just want to remind you guys, at the end of the service, your tithes and offering, you can just drop in the buckets. No, we don't have buckets. We should have buckets. Um, drop in the offering bags at the end of the service. The ushers are there looking nice every week, and you can put it in there. Or give digitally for those digital people at oag.church slash give. And real quick, before I transition to the announcements, because we have quite a few things coming up this week, um, Eli... My son is, of course, just smart. I, I don't know. He doesn't get it from me. But anywho, he has learned to solve the Rubik's Cube in less than a minute, right? His best time is 28 seconds. And he's like, Mom, I want to do this for Speed the Light. I'm like, okay, well, how am I going to do this? So anywho, he is going to do, we're, gonna, we're calling it 60 and 60. And basically, he's going to try to solve it. He thinks he can do more than 60 in 60 seconds, but his fingers are going to get tired. Let's just be honest. But he is going to solve the Rubik's Cube. Yes. Like, it's crazy. He's going to solve the Rubik's Cube at least 60 times in two weeks on April 28th. So after church, he's going to be the entertainment, and then the youth is going to serve up some spaghetti. All of it's going to go to speed the light. And what he's doing is out in the foyer, he's got a little table set up, and he is just taking pledges. The idea is you would pledge maybe 50 cents for every solve he does, or maybe a dollar for every time he solves the cube within that hour. So if you would like to just sponsor Eli or just give a donation to speed the light, we would greatly appreciate it. But this is what my 12-year-old wants to do for missions and I'm like you know what go for it kid you know that's so cool I his daddy and I have learned it and like our best time is less than two minutes a piece but Eli in that 28 seconds like it's just I don't even know with that hair in his face too like I don't know how he does it 
And if you go out to the, to the lobby after church, he's got a whole case that's got all his cubes, and he'll tell you all about it, and it's just, it's crazy. But I'm excited that he is passionate about this, and this is all him. Y'all, this is all him. So just encourage you, you know, go out there. At least tell him, hey, great job. Let him solve it for you today, if anything, all right? So on that note, let me pray for you guys, and then we're going to transition to see what's coming up this week at OAG. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being an amazing, awesome God, because you are good. I know right now in our world, things aren't always good. I know in our world, things aren't always great. But God, you are good. And right now, I just pray in the name of Jesus that you allow us to continue to experience your greatness, to experience your goodness in this place this morning. I pray right now for the message that Pastor Scott's going to bring to us, that you will anoint him, that you will just fill our hearts with your word. Lord, I pray right now for those on line that are watching, that they will feel your presence where they're at, and God, that they will know that they are loved. They might not be in this physical building, but they are still in your kingdom, and that you love them very, very much. Lord, I pray for Pastor and Marcia as they are starting their vacation today. I pray, God, that they will have a safe drive and enjoy their time of rest, and enjoy their time together, and bring them back safely, God. Lord, I just know that you have great things in store for Oxford Assembly of God, not just today, but for this next coming year and the years to come come because God this is your church we are your church family and God I just pray right now that we will all realize that we are part of something bigger but God that you get the glory in everything Lord I love you I love you I love you in Jesus name we pray amen and amen all right if you will turn your attention to the screen and let's see what's coming up this week well hey there and good morning friends we're so excited that you've chosen to worship with us today I'm Pastor Daniel, and there are a lot of great things happening here at OAG. I encourage you to grab your phone and head over to www.oag.church, and let's take a look together. Our children and our teen Bible quiz have been working hard since last year, memorizing scripture and learning God's word. The last Bible quiz competition was this past weekend, and so we'd like to show you what we've learned. Please make plans to join us this evening at 6 p.m. for a Bible quiz showcase. We also have several teens who will be competing in the Fine Arts Festival next weekend and will be showcasing their presentations as well. So come out tonight, support our kids, and see what God is doing. See you there. Good morning, Silver Saints. I'm sorry, that scared me. You just yelled it. I'm sorry. Oh, I was trying to be enthusiastic. Oh, okay. Good morning, Silver Saints. Lou and I would like to invite you to the Joy I can't, I've already gotten them mixed up, I can't. Lou and I would like to invite you to the Joy Luncheon this Thursday at noon in the Fellowship Hall. Our theme this month is, Who Am I? Three couples have volunteered to play a guessing game of Bible characters. So if you can, please bring a side dish or a dessert to add a personal touch to our menu. So, so join, join us, us yes. for this fun Food fellowship. <laughs> and food this Thursday in the <laughs> Fellowship Hall. Sorry. So join us for the fun, food, and fellowship this Thursday in the Fellowship Hall. Looking forward to seeing you. God bless. The annual Leesburg Bike Fest is coming up in just a few weeks. Thousands of bikers from across the nation will descend on Leesburg for a three-day festival. The motorcycle ministry, along with other volunteers, will be helping direct motorcycles and cars where to park in our designated lots as well as passing out water and Bibles at our welcome tent near our parking lots. The funds raised through this event for BGMC will go to the Omega Missions Projects. We are in need of volunteers to make this happen. The only skills needed to help is a smiling face and the love of Jesus. If you would like to learn more, there will be a meeting with the team next Sunday morning following the 10 a.m. service, and a meal will be served. Please be in prayer for the team and the volunteers. Here at OAG, we're all about family. So be sure to connect with ours on our website, social media, or join our digital community. If you have any questions about anything you hear today, stop by the Welcome Center in the lobby or visit our website at oag.church. That's it for now. Now enjoy the rest of the service. I'm coming Thursday for the comedy. How about you? And the food. I'll be there, Lou. All right, save me a spot. Stand with us as we continue to worship the Lord together. Matthew 6, 33 uh, reminds us, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you.
We ask for your wisdom and your guidance. Father, for everyone gathered in this room, as we ask of you, Lord, we know that we can trust that you are faithful to your word. You hear and you answer. So, Lord, we say thank you. Come on, just whisper to him. Say thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer, for hearing my cry as I seek first your kingdom.
as I walked into this room, I sense your presence. And I knew this was the place where love abounds. For this is a temple, Jehovah God abides here. And we are standing.
voice and say, we are, we are standing. I want every voice lifted high. Holy ground. Come on, lift it up. sweet spirit in this place and God I'm not going to move forward because I believe you're doing a work right now will you just begin to magnify him in your own way Will you give him a moment of praise? <laughs> if you can, you can be seated. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. I'm excited to preach this morning. I hope you're ready to receive. Uh, Pastor is away on vacation, as has already been said, and so you're stuck with me. So if this is your first time at Oxford, Next Sunday will be our lead pastor. He'll be back in the pulpit. So you'll hear some good preaching next Sunday. But this Sunday, you're stuck with me. I've got the mic. So I've got, I mean, I'm free all afternoon. I don't know what you were planning on doing. 
I do have a wedding to go to at 4 o'clock, but other than that, I'm good. Um, so it's 10.30. we got plenty of time. So just a reminder also, next Sunday we are having a baptismal service after the 10 a.m. service. Uh, so today is the last Sunday to sign up. So if you recently gave your life to Christ, rededicated your life, or if you know someone that would like to be baptized, please encourage them to go ahead and stop by the Welcome Center. Um, they'll take down some information, and we would love to, to get you signed up. Uh, baptismal services among the staff, that's one of our favorite Sundays. It's very special to me when I see someone not just give their heart to Jesus. I'm thankful for that. But when they take that next step of faith and they get baptized, there's just something special about that. So uh, make sure you come and you join and encourage those that need to be baptized. Encourage them to follow in Christ's footsteps. Amen. That's what Christ did. And we're following in his footsteps. So be sure to stop by. So God's presence is already here. I don't know if you knew that or not. But I'm going to go ahead and pray. No, regardless. Father... I don't want this to just be another service where someone proclaims your word, we sing a few songs, we pray, and then we go on about like nothing happened. God, I'm asking for you to change us today. And I mean that. Change me. Change who I am. Change every single person in this room. God, you knew exactly who was going to be here before this day ever came. And so, God, I'm praying that something that would be said in this service today would be a benefit to someone here, that would give them that word of hope maybe that they need. Father, I proclaim your word today with boldness and authority that it has. And Holy Spirit, we know that you are here, but we ask that you keep coming even in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you have your Bible, I'd like for you to open it to Luke chapter 8, verse 22. Luke chapter 8, verse 22. If you forgot your Bibles at home, no problem. We'll have the scripture for you up on the screens. And here's what it says. One day he, Jesus, got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and as they sailed, he, meaning Jesus, fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. He said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this, that he commands even the winds and water and they obey him. I want to tell you something this morning, friends, that is not going to get a whole lot of applause or amens in the crowd. But it's the truth. In this life, we're going to face storms. But it depends on where we anchor, whether we survive or whether we perish. The evangelist whose ministry I got saved under, her name is Marilyn Weeks, once shared in a message that she shared that new recruits in the Navy are taught early on in their training where they should anchor. They are discouraged from anchoring to the shore because doing so is sure destruction. See, when a hurricane is coming, people will often that have boats, they will often tie their boats up to their piers inland, and they think their boat is safe, and they'll tie it up real tight, and they'll think this boat's not going anywhere. But guess what? After the hurricane, they will find their boat is now on the bottom because as the tides rise, their boats are not able to rise with it because of the tight ropes keeping it bound to the pier. And so water will begin to capsize and enter their boat. But here's what the Navy teaches. When storms come, go out into the deep and anchor. You see, that's the problem with many Christians today. Their relationship with God is a superficial one. But let me tell you, when you get in the habit of spending time with the Lord every single day, when you feel like it and when you don't, when you see him come through before your very eyes, let me tell you what happens when you see a storm on the horizon. People will not find you anxious. They will not find you shaking in your boots. They will not find you doubting God's plan. They won't find you looking at your horoscope for, for advice and, uh, and, and, and suggestions on what you should do next. They'll find you in your easy chair with your feet up because you know your father has got this. 
Let me tell you a few things, though, about the deep. Not everything is cupcakes and unicorns, as my wife likes to say in the deep. If you've ever been on a cruise ship or been on a charter boat and gone way out to sea, when you first get on that ship, you will see people everywhere by the harbor. Many workers, they're loading, the porters are loading your bags onto the ship. They're bringing all the groceries on that you're going to eat and, 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 and admire and love. And you're going to eat way too much of it. And they know that. That's why they pack all of it on there. But many workers are at the harbor, people on the sidelines watching as the ship pulls out and heads out to sea. But something happens when you get out from that harbor and you get out into that deep blue sea. When you look out, you won't see a soul out there other than you and those that are on that ship with you. And let me tell you something, when nightfall comes, you look out into that vast ocean and it gets real dark and it gets very freaky. But here's what I want to tell someone listening to this message today. You may be in here or you may be online. While you may feel like you're in the middle of the storm in the middle of the night and it's dark and you feel like you are all alone and you don't see anyone around you in your struggle, I want you to know something. Jesus is in that boat. He's not just on the sidelines watching you, friend. He's in the boat with you. And let me tell you, if Jesus is in that boat, that boat is going to float. Let me say that one more time for the people in the back that fell asleep already. Wake up. I said, if Jesus is in that boat, that boat is going to float. The seas may war. The winds may blow. But that boat is not going down if Jesus is in it. So when you are faced with a situation, let me assure you of something. It might be a trying time. Trust me, we've all been there. You might have to face obstacles that you didn't see coming, that you didn't want to face. But just stay in that boat with Jesus, friend, and watch as that boat is going to sail right through that storm. And yes, it will come out the other side victorious. I want to reread verse 22 for us. One day he, meaning Jesus, got into a boat with his disciples. And he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So our first point this morning is this. Sometimes the storm is a result of our obedience. Many people in the church believe that as long as someone does exactly as God wants me to do, A, B, C, then we will be free from negative consequences. But friends, I have some bad news for all of us. The rain is going to fall regardless. And sometimes the rain will fall even though you are doing exactly what God told you to do. As one theologian put it, Jonah ended up in a storm because of his disobedience. But the disciples got into a storm because of their obedience to the Lord. What did the disciples do? They did exactly what Jesus told them to do. Jesus told them, get into the boat. Did Jesus know what was going to happen? Possibly. But here's what we know for sure. The disciples did exactly as they were told. That is not up for discussion. It's not up for debate. They did as they were told. And I feel today that some of you have done exactly what God has told you to do, and you have found yourself in a position that seems like a literal hell on earth. And I just want you to know that sometimes it is our obedience that leads us into the storm, but you should not be afraid because, again, Jesus is there with you. Let me tell you, it doesn't matter if you live your life for Jesus or not. You are going to face storms in this life. The question is, do you want to go through these storms on your own? Or do you want to do it with someone that has a proven track record of always being on time? Always persevering. Always coming through. The one that has never lost a battle. The one that has always provided. And the one that is always faithful. If I've got to go through the storm, friends, I'll do it with Jesus. You can do it on your own. That's your prerogative. But I'm going to do it with Jesus. I want you to understand something today, friends. You should not be surprised 
when storms come. The disciples were used to these storms on the Sea of Galilee. They were a very common occurrence. And if you look at the geography around the Sea of Galilee, you will find that the Sea of Galilee is 13 miles long at its longest point, and it is 8 miles wide at its widest point, and it is surrounded by mountains all around. So when the, when the wind blows across the sea, it creates a very turbulent sea. This is a daily occurrence, and they were very used to this. The disciples should not have been surprised by a storm. This should not have caught them off guard, but yet we see that it startled them to the point of complete desperation. But what they forgot was Jesus made them a promise when he gave them orders to get in that boat. He said, let us go across to the other side of the lake. Jesus didn't say, let us perish in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, he told them, we're going to the other side. There was not a question in his language. And I want to tell you something. Jesus has not abandoned you, and he has promised you, and he will fulfill his promises that he's going to get you to that other side. Now, you may have to go through some things between here and there, but I am telling you, Jesus is going to get you through to that other side. We are going to the other side. I feel like I need to tell you, Jesus is promising you today you're going to get to the other side if you will just trust him. I know it may look bleak. I know Satan is shouting doubts and negativity, but let me encourage you today, friend. Do not listen to the author of lies. Start listening to the one that cannot lie. Stop listening to the one that wants you dead and start listening to the one that gave you life and life more abundantly. It's a shame that it seems like we have more people in the church that get caught up in focusing their attention on Satan instead of the lost all around them. Friend, you don't need to worry about the plans of Satan. I could care less what Satan is planning because I've read the end of the book and I know his destiny. There isn't a plan that Satan can come up with that will throw God off and catch him by surprise. How many of you are thankful for that? I don't care what Satan is up to. I care about the lost because that's what Jesus told me to be concerned about. But so many people are so concerned. Well, Scott, don't you, aren't you afraid of what you see in the world today? No, I'm not. Because I know my destiny. But you know what? I need to bring as many along with me as I possibly can. That's what my eyes are fixed on. Don't be fixed on the storm around you. That does not matter. Let Jesus take care of that. You focus on the lost. Now let me tell you why many don't spend time sharing their faith with, with the lost. People don't share their faith because it's not the easy thing to do. It's inconvenient. Have you ever been in a Walmart? or in a checkout line, and the Holy Spirit nudged you and said, hey, that person ahead of you, talk to them. And you think, well, I'm in a hurry. I ain't got time for this right now. It's not the easy thing to do. See, the Holy Spirit is often like that. He nudges us at times when is least convenient. But church, just because it's difficult doesn't mean that God is not in it. We have too many sissified Christians in the church today that believe that if it's difficult, then it must not be of God. But I want you to show me in the Bible, church, where a person that was after God's heart and yet they never faced adversity. Show me someone. I'll wait for a name. Because there's no one in the Bible that did not face some kind of adversity. God expects us to do our part. And when we do our part, when we do that, God steps in and begins to add his super to what we can do, our natural. The disciples in this passage had a role to play. They had to be obedient. But their obedience landed them directly in the middle of a storm. Now, I'm going to tell you, during my time at Southeastern University, I kept hearing students from the time I stepped foot on that campus. I kept hearing the name of a professor. I didn't know what he taught. I didn't know anything about him. But there was one thing that I heard over and over and over again. Even those that were not taking Bible classes knew this. They told me, they said, if you want to pass... Do not take any class taught by Dr. Joseph Davis because you will fail. It was just a matter of fact. Students that normally get A's in every single class fail his class. And I'm going to tell you something. 
He, is no, he was known as the hardest professor on that campus, and he still teaches there today in case you would like to go back to college. Um, he, and he, I'm going to tell you something. He enjoys that reputation. So guess what I did? Being the go-with-the-flow type that never goes against the grain, I signed up for his class. <laughs> he was teaching Theology 1. And I'm here to tell you that was the most intense, stressful, uncomfortable class that I have ever taken in my entire college career. It even tops college algebra 2, and I thought I would never pass that class. <laughs> to the glory of God, after three times, I passed it. Why did I take his class? I took his class because I thought to myself, you know, I would rather take a class that challenges me, stretches me enough to the point that if I was asked a theological question by an unbeliever, I would be able to answer it and be a better witness for Christ. I grew more than words can express because of that class. I didn't get the best grade in that class of all of them, but I'm going to tell you something. I got my money's worth out of that class. I got what I came for. I wanted to learn more about him. And when it came time to sign up for Theology 2, guess who I picked? Dr. Davis. Now, am I saying that I came away from the class with all the right answers? I'm here to tell you no. I came away with more questions than I did answers because it began to create in me a deeper way of thinking about God that I had never thought of before. But see, just because it's difficult doesn't mean that we should tuck our tails under and run away. Many people want you to believe that if you're facing difficult times, then you must have sinned against God. Ever heard that before? And this is God's way of getting even. People said the same thing to Job. But what did, what did God say about the storm that Job was facing? In essence, God told Job, you are not in control. And unless you know all things, you have no right to accuse me of wrongdoing by allowing this storm to come into your life. Let me be clear about something. If you are facing a storm today, I don't know why God has chosen to allow it to come into your life. But here's what I do know. If you'll just stand and be faithful to what God asks of you. He will get you through, and you'll come out the other side with more, just like, you, just like Job did, than what you had when the storm started. So just stand on God's word, because the storm has a purpose. You are either going to grow, you are going to realize how, how insignificant you are and how magnificent God is. You are going to realize how weak you are and how great God is. Or here's another one. Others around you are going to witness your faith and God's faithfulness and be encouraged and drawn to him. So our first point, sometimes the storm is a result of our obedience. Our second point this morning, Jesus isn't afraid of the storm that you're facing so you can relax. Verse 23 says, so they set out and as they sailed, he fell asleep and a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him. It would make sense if Jesus fell asleep before the storm came. But I want you to notice that even when the storm was raging, the waves were coming in. I just want to point something out to you. You may have in your mind that, this is, that the disciples are on this ginormous wonder of the seas cruise ship. They're not on a cruise ship, friends. They're on a rowboat, okay? We're talking a long time ago. So let me, if you've ever been on a cruise ship that's been in the middle of a storm, you might think there is no way you're going to feel a single thing. This cruise ship is huge. Oh, no, you feel stuff. Have you ever been in the dining room and you got your glass of water there on your table and you just see that thing doing this? If you've never been motion sickness before, you will on a cruise ship. But the amazing thing is Jesus was in this tiny boat. Just imagine how much they were feeling as the waves were pounding into that. But Jesus stayed asleep through it all. It would make sense if he fell asleep before the storm. But even while the storm was going on, he was still asleep. Now, I know some people are heavy sleepers, but friends, this is on a whole nother level. This isn't sleeping like we know sleeping. This type of sleep only comes when a person is at complete peace, knowing that God has it all under 
control. And I'm going to be honest with you, friends. I should be able to sleep like that. We all should be able to sleep like that. But truth be told, we don't. Because the Spirit would often lead Jesus to minister to people wherever he was along his journey. He was often, he would catch sleep wherever he could. And sometimes those places were a little unorthodox. But here's what I want us to notice. Jesus' mind and heart were peaceful enough, trusting in the love and the care of his Father in heaven, that he could sleep in the midst of that storm. I believe Pastor Craig Rochelle said it best when he said this. Never let the presence of a storm cause you to doubt the presence of God. Jesus knew no matter what, he was safe in the presence of his Father. Friends, we need to stop giving the devil more credit than he deserves. He does not have authority over your life. And while he may be able to create storms in your life, here's what you need to do. Just take a seat in your lazy boy chair, put your feet up, get comfortable, get a nice cup of coffee, or in my case, a soda, and watch Jesus go to work on your behalf. There is no need to get anxious about the things that Satan threatens you with. I've gotten to the point in my life, friends, that when Satan threatens me, I just stand, laugh in his face, and I say, go right on ahead. That may seem a little egotistical, but I'm not bragging on myself and my own abilities. I am bragging on my God. Satan is under God's authority, and the only way something is going to happen is if God allows it to. And I know that if God allows it to happen it is for my good so can I be at so I can be at peace even while the seas around me are raging even while those are those are, are around me are against me even when I don't know what to do because I know that as long as I stand firm with God I will be blessed we need to stop wasting energy on fear because it's not worth our time instead we should be praying Here's what Pastor Craig Rochelle said. Prayer reminds us we are not in control and keeps us close to the one that is. I want to be close to him. Because the closer that I am to him, the more I am assured that all is well with my soul. Can I tell you something that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me? Some people fear storms, but they have absolutely no fear of God. Pastor Jim Rayleigh recently said, when the church gets a fear of God, the devil will get a fear of the church. I have made up in my mind, friends, that the devil is going to fear OAG. If you want to go to some spiritually sissified church, you're in the wrong church on the wrong Sunday with the wrong preacher standing behind this pulpit. This is going to be a praying church. This is going to be a giving church. This is going to be a fasting church. This is going to be a church that binds the devil and takes authority over demons because we have that authority. This is going to be a church where people get saved, healed, delivered, and filled with the Holy Ghost. When we decide to operate like that, there is not a single thing the enemy can do, and he knows better than to touch that church. Jesus was at peace in the midst of that storm because he was close to the Father. It is time for us to get close to the Father, friends. I want you to take notice of something else. When Jesus awoke, what did he say? He rebuked the disciples and said, where is your faith? Jesus didn't say, my, 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 look at this terrible storm. What are we going to do? The storm did not disturb Jesus. The first thing he acknowledged was the unfaith, the unbelief of his disciples. The storm did not disturb Jesus, but the unbelief of his disciples did. Friends, difficult circumstances, storms are not evidence of unbelief. Unbelief is the rejection of a promise or a command that God has given us relevant to our particular situation. And in this situation, Jesus told them they were going over to the other side. But when the storms rose, they started to doubt. They believed Jesus enough to get in the boat in the beginning when the storm, when, the, when it was everything was calm. But when the waters started raging, 
Then they begin to question it. Don't start to doubt God when you see the waves come. Just allow them to grow your faith. I believe some of you need to get alone with the Lord. You see, if you don't, if you don't spend time with God and in His Word, you will forget what He is capable of and what He has already done. He has a proven track record, friends. Pastor Jim Rayleigh said David sat alone before he sat on the throne. He was alone in the wilderness. He went to bypass. A lot of people want to bypass those days. You see, isolation often precedes elevation. God will get you all by yourself where you've got no one else to depend on, no one else to count on, no one else to rely on. And it is in those moments that you find out that he has always been your source. Sometimes you've got to leave the herd in order to be heard. I don't want to sound like everyone else. I don't want to preach like everyone else. I don't want my worship to be like everybody else. I'm not slamming anyone else, but I have made up in my mind that I will want more of God and I will run alone if that's what I have to do. Who is behind me, church? So our third point this morning, now if I was a true Pentecostal preacher, this would be it. Assembly of God, we have three point sermons and that's it. Our third point today, we serve a God that is in control. Verse 24 and he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. Friends, we serve a God that is in control of it all. It's a bit comical to me, if you read this passage, that the disciples were first fearful of the storm, but then once Jesus did exactly what they asked him to do, which was calm the waters, then they became fearful of Jesus. Verse 25. And they were afraid, talking about Jesus here, after Jesus calmed the storm. And they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even winds and water, and they obey him? The calm of the sea should have been, should have been a great peaceful sign to them. But instead, they were just as afraid when he calmed the storm as when they were in the midst of the storm. We should not be surprised when Jesus answers our prayers. We need to remember that God hears us, that God cares about us, that God loves us. And when we pray, we are actually talking to the Father. This is not a, I hope you get this message, Lord. No, he hears you the second the thought comes into your mind and you utter that word. Even before you pray a single word, that thought got to him. This is not a, I hope you get this message. He got it. Our God is in control. Some theologians that are much smarter and wiser than I am suggest that Satan might have been behind this storm. And here's why they suggest this. Number one, the disciples were fishermen. And as I've already said, they encountered storms almost daily in the Sea of Galilee. So they should not have been surprised by a storm. It tends to suggest that this storm was unlike anything they had ever encountered before. Second, according to Scripture... Jesus rebuked the winds and the raging water. He didn't just say, peace be still. Scripture tells us that he rebuked them. Third, when Jesus and the disciples made it to the other side, just as Jesus said that they would, Jesus was immediately confronted with a demon-possessed man who called himself Legion because he was possessed by many demons. Regardless of what your thoughts are, whether this storm was created by Satan or not, one thing is certain. Jesus has the final say. If Satan was behind it, he probably thought to himself, here is a perfect opportunity to take out Jesus and all his little preachers by drowning them and defeating the purposes of God and thus preventing salvation from coming. This was certainly an opportunity of the century for the enemy of the human race, but God had the final say. There's a new worship song that came out recently that I have been obsessed with because the lyrics of this song are greatly anointed. Here are some of the lyrics. For me and my house, we're going to serve you. For me and my house, you'll get the praise. For me and my house, we're going to love you always. We have set our homes apart for you. 
Let your glory come and fill each room. Pour out your peace, move in your strength, flood with your healing stream. We have set our homes apart for you. For me and my house, you're gonna, we're going to worship. For me and my house, you'll get your way. For me and my house, we're going to love you always. We declare our homes are holy ground. Sons and daughters are arising now. Let the young see, let the old dream, till joy has been released. We declare our homes are holy ground. And here is the bridge of the song. This is my favorite part. We speak to the enemy. You can't have my family because we belong to the Lord. With heaven's authority, we take back our destiny because we belong to the Lord. That's the stance we need to take against the enemy, church. He has no power over us. He tells us every day that he does, but I am telling you, you can take this to the bank. He does not, and he knows he has nothing. God is in control. So relax today knowing that God has got you. Here's what I hope you take away from this simple message today. In relation to whatever is causing you anxiety, fear, and tribulation, one of three things is going to happen in the end. Number one, it may never happen. Number two, it may happen and it will not be as bad as what you thought. Number three, it may happen, but God is going to carry you through it. While I know some of you are facing very real and ongoing battles, I pray that this empowers someone. And I, I, I say this almost every day to myself. Don't let the devil rob you of the present by convincing you to worry about the future. Satan so many times wants us to worry about what's coming ahead. But I want you to know something today, church. The same God that is with you today is standing in your future, and he's got it all worked out. I don't need to be concerned about what's coming down the road. I have no idea what that is, but God does. And if he's gotten me this far and he's held, holding me in the palm of his hand, I trust he's going to get me through it. And whatever it is, whatever I may face along that journey from here to there, if I face obstacles, I'm just going to lift my hands and say, God, I know you have this. That's not the easy thing to do. But you know what? He's got it. Matthew 6, 26, a very familiar passage. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Drop down now to verse 34. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. For those of you that are hurting today, remember that your valley is not your destination. God never says that we will not go through valleys and turbulent times, but he does promise that we will not go through them alone. We may enjoy God on those mountaintops, been there, done that. But I'm going to tell you something. I have learned that it's in those valleys that I get closer to him than I've ever been before. There is no storm that he will not bring you through. There is no obstacle that he will not help you overcome. There is no enemy that he will not defeat. And there is no heartache that he will not heal. Now, this would be a great place to wrap up this message. And to be honest with you, when I was working on this and praying through this, I felt like this was it until God nudged me and wanted me to go just a little bit deeper. We've talked about faith and how we should always trust in the plans of God, no matter what we see around us. But this morning, I want to be transparent with you, and I pray that this minister to someone. I believe God is real beyond a shadow of a doubt. How many of you believe that? I believe he loves me. I believe he can heal me of any disease, anything that I overcome, anything that comes into my life. I believe he can make the anxiety go away. I believe he'll always be there for me. I believe he will supply my every need because he has time and time again. I believe I can find rest in him. I believe in all of these things, and therefore you would think nothing could deter my faith. But if I'm being honest with you, there are some days 
when I just don't feel it. You see, there is a difference between believing it and feeling it. Maybe you are more spiritual than I am, and if so, go you. But I want to be transparent with you because I believe we have enough preachers that stand behind pulpits saying one thing and living another. I'm committed to not be one of them. I want to be real with you. I don't want, I don't want to wear a mask up here and pretend like I have it all together because I'm telling you, newsflash, this guy is not perfect. I have days when I feel like I had the faith to conquer the world, and then I have days when it's tough just to get out of the bed in the morning. Listen, if you're sad about one thing or fearful about one thing, it's manageable. But when you've got it coming from all different directions, all sides at the same time, and it all just seems to be piling up, you cannot even resolve it. You have someone ask you what is wrong, and you tell them, I don't even know. I can't tell you because it's just so much. The weight is so heavy. And trying to manage our emotions is like pulling the Christmas lights out of the attic. It is all tangled and bundled up, and we don't even know where to begin. Listen, if that's you today... I have some good news, and I'm preaching this to myself. God is not a feeling. So here we go. Because God is not a feeling, your feelings are not dependent upon his presence. The Holy Spirit will make you feel, but he's not a feeling. You see, here's what God wants us to do, and here's what he wanted the disciples to do. We need to separate our feelings from our faith. Because we need to have faith regardless of what we are feeling. God is not afraid of our feelings, nor is he limited by them. And here's the last point that I want to make today. God is with you forever, but feelings are with you temporarily. Amen. Praise team, if you can come back now. Listen to me, friends. Feelings change and they change very frequently throughout the day one person says something to you and you will go from having the best day to having the worst day all because of something that one person said can i give all of us including myself some advice we need to stop investing in something that is going to change so quickly the issue is, if we're not careful, we will allow the way we feel one day to dictate the amount of faith that we have. But our faith is not based on how we feel, church. Our faith is based on nothing less than Christ and Christ alone, the unchanging, solid rock. I've got some good news and some bad news. Here's the good news. The feeling that you're feeling right now will not last long. That's something to praise God for. The depression that you're feeling will not last long. The anxiety that you feel will not last long. The pain that you feel will not last long. Young people, you went through a breakup. Don't worry, it's not going to last forever. You will move on. You'll probably break up from 10, 10 other people. The pain will change. That's the good news. But here is the bad news. You are investing a lot of time energy, worry, and thought into something that's not going to last long. Listen to me, the pain that you are experiencing today will pass. But can I tell you what will never pass away? What is an ever-present help in your time of need? What will be present long after your current feelings take a hike? His name is Jesus. If you're going through a battle like the disciples were in that boat, that day and it's causing you anxiety to the point that your faith is wavering can I remind you of something and I've already said this but I want to say it one more time God is not a feeling so if you'll just start to lift your hands and start focusing on the one that is eternal I promise you that investment will return a good dividend because even when you don't feel him he's working even when you don't see it He's working. Even when you are sleeping, he's working. Come on, someone. Don't make me stand up here and preach and preach and praise all by myself. I don't care what you feel. He is faithful. That's who he is. He is a way maker. He is a miracle worker. He is a promise keeper regardless of what your feelings are telling you this morning. It is time for us to speak to our feelings and say get in alignment with God's word or get out. 
Let me tell you, the greatest thing you can do in the middle of a storm like the disciples were facing that day is to lift your hands and say, God, I worship you regardless of what I see around me. I may see torment. I may see storms. I may see raging seas. But God, I'm keeping my eyes fixed on you because I know you're going to get me through this. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. He's not controlled by emotion. He's not controlled by a feeling. Thank you, Lord. <sighs> Pastor Jeff and the worship team is going to lead us into the song Waymaker. And if you need to get your feelings into alignment with who God really is, I want you to come down to the altar. And I believe because I have prayed it, that as you praise at this altar, those shackles are going to come off. And let me tell you, I am not interrupting the Spirit. We are a Pentecostal church, and God is going to have His way when I preach because none of you have come to hear from a man. You have come to receive and hear from the Lord. And that you will. So I am not going to close the service like we typically do. I'm not going to have a formal closing. I'm going to have a very informal closing because I don't want anyone to feel rushed. If God is ministering to you, you can stay here all afternoon. It does not bother me one bit. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray, and I want you to come to the altar if God is drawing you. God, break out in this house. Fall on this place. God, we want to see a move that will forever change us into being better witnesses for you. We don't want to be controlled by our feelings and emotions. We want to be compelled by the Holy Spirit. We don't want you just to give us goosebumps so that we can go home and say, that was a great service. I feel so great. We want to be transformed into people that care for the lost. The Holy Spirit was given to make us a powerful witness. And God, unfortunately, many of people in the church have made it more about a feeling instead of empowerment. God, you are faithful. And we are going to praise you regardless of what we see coming around us, regardless of what we see on the horizon, because you are worthy of it. And we know that as long as we keep our eyes on you, you promise to keep us in the palm of your hand. Holy Spirit, come and have your way in this place in Jesus' name. If you feel led to come to this altar, the altar is open for you right now as we sing this song. I worship you. You are here. You are here. Working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You are here. Moving in our midst. I worship you.
Wow, what an incredible moment we've just experienced as a church family. In fact, let's pray together right now. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us to be all that you've created us to be and help us to represent the church as we go through our life. Now, as we continue praying, I know that there are some of you right now, you realize that all this talk about the church doesn't resonate with you or, or maybe you've been in church for many years, but you don't really know God. If that's you, that probably like many other people, you don't really know God, who God is, or maybe you just don't know Jesus. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Son of the living God. And because of sin, you and I were separated from our Heavenly Father. But Jesus came into this world, and instead of us paying the price, He paid the price for us. And He died on the cross, and He rose again so that you and I would have eternal life, so that our relationship with God would be restored. And how do we receive this eternal life? Well, it's so simple. The Bible says that we just need to believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know you can sense the tugging on your heart. I want you to decide right now. I want you to invite Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life. If that's you, raise your hand right now, wherever you are or just in the chat area and let us know and repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner Save me, Lord. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. Make me new. I invite you to be my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And from this day, I choose to live for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Congratulations to every one of you that just prayed that prayer and made this decision to follow Jesus. I'm telling you, this is a life-changing moment. Together, we are the church, so welcome to the family of God. If you're wondering, what do I do next, Pastor Daniel? Well, it's simple. I want you to tell us. 
Tell us that you decided to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life because we want to walk with you as you start this journey. It's super simple. You can let us know in the chat or our team will connect with you. And as you do that, I want you to realize this. This is not just a video you're watching. No, no, no. This is your church and we are here for you. I'm real. We're, we're, I'm talking to you right now because I care about you. And I believe God brought you here for this purpose. He's got incredible things planned for you. And we'd love to walk with you as you start this journey. So make sure you let us know that you've decided to follow Jesus. And I want you to bring somebody to church with you next week because church is not the same if we don't have our friends and our family. So bring everybody you know. Now, before you go, there are many ways to stay connected with what's happening here at OAG. You can visit our website at www.oag.church, follow us on Instagram, or join our Facebook group. If you have any questions about anything you've heard today, be sure to connect with us online at oag.church. We are the family church for the family of God, and we are praying for you.